Welcome to Corporate Finance Explained, where we break down the essential topics every corporate finance professional needs to know. This series is narrated by AI, created using CFI's expert training materials, and designed to help you stay ahead in the world of finance. Enjoy this week's deep dive. Every major corporation you can think of, you know, from the apples of the world right down to, well, the big failures like Enron, they all have a story, a real story. Mm-hmm. And that story, it isn't really told in their mission statements, is it? Or the marketing fluff? No, not at all. It's told uh, pretty clearly through numbers. Right. Definitely. Financial ratios are like the essential shorthand for that. They're the tools analysts use to take these massive, complicated financial statements and boil them down. Boil them down into what exactly? Into simple, actionable indicators, performance, efficiency, yeah. and yeah, even existential risk. Okay. The sources we use for this deep dive, they really cut through that complexity, which is great. So our mission for you today is to show exactly how analysts use these ratios. Mm -hmm. Spotting red flags, measuring real business quality. Yeah, and we'll use some specific contrasting examples companies you know to make it stick. Okay, let's unpack this. Let's see how these simple indicators reveal, well, pretty much everything about a company's health. Absolutely. And ratios matter so much because... Mm -hmm. um, Context is everything, right? Revenue by itself doesn't tell you much. Just big number. Exactly. Yeah. Not until you compare it to costs or assets or the equity shareholders have put in. Ratios give you that vital context. For benchmarking against competitors, seeing trends over time. And making those big decisions, investment decisions, operational ones, they really are an early warning system. And these warnings, these signals, they usually fall into four main categories, right? Four pillars of analysis. That's a good way to put it. Yeah, four yeah. pillars. First... Uh, liquidity ratios, basically, can the company pay its immediate bills? Got enough financial breathing room. Okay, crucial. What's second? Second, profitability ratios. This answer is the big one. Is all that growth actually turning into real returns? Is the business making money effectively? Makes sense. Third? Third, we look at leverage ratios. This flags the level of uh, balance sheet risk hiding underneath those returns. Mm-hmm. Are the profits fueled by a mountain of debt? Ah, the hidden dangers. And finally. And finally. Efficiency ratios. These show how well the company turns its inputs, you know, inventory assets into actual output, into revenue. You know, for a lot of people, ratios sound so academic, just accounting stuff. Right. But what's fascinating here and what our sources emphasize is that these are actually strategic tools. CEOs, CFOs, they track them constantly. Oh, absolutely. They use them to talk to investors, sure. But more importantly to guide where they put their money, their capital allocation, aligning it with the business strategy. So these aren't just grades on a report card? Not at all. They're more like the dials executives are actively turning. Okay, let's start with the absolute foundation then, liquidity. Because, I mean, if a company can't pay its bills next week, nothing else really matters, does it? Pretty much. So we start with the basic current ratio. Current assets versus current liabilities. A simple check on short-term coverage. And then for a sort of stricter tests. Right. Analysts immediately go to the quick ratio, sometimes called the acid test ratio. Why acid test? Because it strips out inventory from the current assets. Inventory, you see, is often the least liquid asset. It can take time to sell. Okay, so taking out inventory gives a tougher picture. A ratio above one generally means a cushion. Generally, yeah. Suggests a comfortable cushion. But, and this is key, Context again. Context always. Look at Walmart. Our sources point out Walmart often runs with a current ratio that might look, well, a bit low, maybe even below one sometimes. Which sounds worrying on the surface. It would be if you didn't know how they operate. Walmart's liquidity isn't about holding tons of cash. It's about incredible operational efficiency, their cash conversion cycle. Explain that cycle quickly. They sell inventories so incredibly fast, and they have such good terms with suppliers that they often get cash from you, the customer, before they even have to pay the company that made the product. Wow. So they're essentially using their supplier's money to operate. In a way, yes. They operate on negative working capital. Mm -hmm. So for them, a low current ratio is actually a sign of strength, of efficiency, not weakness. That's, yeah, yeah, that's like financial jujitsu. Okay, let's jump to the metrics everyone talks about. Profitability. Operating margin, return on assets, ROA, return on equity, ROE. And the classic comparison here is Apple versus Dell. Perfect contrast. Tell us why. Well, Apple is just the benchmark, isn't it? 
They consistently post these amazing industry-leading operating margins in ROA. And it's not just selling lots of phones. It's more than volume. It's their mm-hmm. brand power. They can charge premium prices. And they have incredible cost control, partly from owning so much of their process, that ecosystem lock-in. Their margins are really well protected. Okay, so Apple sets the bar high. What about Dell? Dell Technologies, as our sources note, operates with much, much tighter margins, both gross and operating. Why is that? It just reflects the fierce competition in the broader PC market. It's harder to stand out, to differentiate, compared to Apple's walled garden, you know. Dell competes more on volume, efficiency. Apple competes on margin. Different game. Totally different games. Now, quick warning flag on ROE, return on equity. It sounds great how well management uses shareholder money. But a high ROE can be um, artificially inflated by just piling on debt, Mm -hmm. excessive leverage. So a high ROE might actually be masking serious risk, not signaling real strength. You always have to look deeper. Got it. Always look under the hood. Okay, speaking of strength, let's talk operational muscle efficiency. How fast do they move products? How hard do their assets work? And Walmart comes up again here. Master of speed. Their inventory turnover ratio is exceptionally high. Meaning they sell through their stock incredibly quickly. Exactly. It reflects that optimized supply chain, massive scale, just relentless product movement. And the contrast. Well, contrast that with a really asset intensive business. Think Boeing. Ah, airplanes. Different beast entirely. Completely. Their inventory turnover is naturally slow. I mean, it takes years and huge amounts of capital to build a plane. So that slow turnover reflects the complex, long production cycles. So if slow inventory turnover is just normal for Boeing, what ratio does become the critical stress test for them, especially after, say, major disruptions? Yeah, after 2019, with all their issues, analysts immediately zoomed in on leverage and interest coverage. Their long cycles, plus all that capital tied up, It meant their debt-to-equity ratio and their interest coverage ratio became the absolute key focus for checking financial stability. Which leads us perfectly into leverage, where, like you said, return amplification meets risk amplification, metrics like debt-to-EBITDA and interest coverage. Right. Let's define EBITDA quickly. Earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. It's often used as a rough proxy for, like, operating cash flow. Okay. And debt-to-EBITDA. It basically tells you, in theory how many years of those operating earnings it would take to pay off all the company's debt. A higher number means more leverage, more risk. Netflix is an interesting case here, isn't it? Our sources mentioned they carried really high debt to EBITDA for a while. They did. Very high. But was that just bad? Or was it strategic? I mean, they needed billions for content spending to grow, right? It was absolutely strategic. And yes, context matters hugely. Netflix made a massive bet. They knew the debt ratio looked scary for a few years. What was the bet? The bet was that explosive subscriber growth and rising operating margins would quickly improve their ability to cover the interest payments, the interest coverage ratio. And, well, they pulled it off. They executed the pivot. Exactly. They grew into their debt structure, brought the ratios back into a more comfortable zone, and investors regained confidence. Mm -hmm. It was high risk, high reward strategy playing out in the ratios. Okay, so that's strategic leverage. Then there's Dell again. With a different profile. Yeah, Dell's leverage story is different. Our sources highlight its debt-to-equity ratio is often higher than tech peers. But that reflects its history. The big leveraged buyouts restructuring the whole company. It's structural leverage, not just temporary spending leverage like Netflix. And then when leverage goes wrong, we get the cautionary tales. Oh, yes. Bed Bath & Beyond is a textbook example. Yeah. Years before the bankruptcy, the warning signs were flashing. What were they? The current ratio was getting worse and worse flagging those immediate liquidity problems we talked about. And at the same time, the debt-to-equity ratio was climbing, signaling deeper structural issues. And didn't share buybacks play a role? Ironically, yes. The sources note they were doing aggressive share buybacks, which makes earnings per share look good in the short term. But they were funding it partly with debt or by draining their cash. So they were weakening the actual balance sheet while polishing the EPS number. Wow. Boosting the optics while bleeding internally? Yeah. That sequence sounds chillingly familiar. It brings us to the ultimate case study, doesn't it, Enron? The absolute classic, yes. Before the collapse in 2001, Enron looked great on paper, didn't it? Strong revenue growth, reported profitability seemed okay. Seemed okay. But But the rot was visible if you look beyond the income statement. Analysts who focused hard on the cash flow statement saw huge inconsistencies way before the end. What kind of inconsistencies? How did cash flow reveal the deception? The critical insight was this. Enron's reported profits 
Those seemingly strong earnings were not coming from its actual operations. Where are they coming from then? Largely from financing activities. Borrowing huge amounts of money, selling off assets, they were basically plugging operational cash shortfalls with debt and asset sales. So earnings up here, operational cash flow way down there? Exactly that divergence. Yeah. That gap was the flashing red light. It screamed that the profitability wasn't real, wasn't sustainable, and the rapidly rising debt ratios just confirmed the bomb was ticking. Cash flow told the real story. It just shows these numbers aren't static snapshots. They show movement, strategy, over time. Let's look at how ratio trends signal success or failure. Tesla is a good example here. Right. In Tesla's early days, remember, their gross margins were all over the place. Volatile. They were figuring out mass production, huge scaling challenges. Solving massive engineering problems on the fly. Totally. But then, over time, you saw a sustained improvement in their asset turnover, meaning they were getting more revenue bang for their asset buck, and their operating margins started to climb steadily. And that trend showed. It showed that crucial transition from a high burn, volatile startup to a business achieving, you know, sustainable growth and real operational maturity. The trend lines told the story of scaling success. And we saw the reverse, maybe, with companies that got a huge temporary boost, like Zoom. Perfect example. During the peak pandemic period, Zoom's profitability, liquidity ratios, they surged, obviously. Massive demand. Off the charts. But then, post-pandemic, things normalized. Efficiency ratios like revenue per employee or asset turnover, they came back down to earth. It shows how external shocks can create temporary spikes, but ratios often revert as markets stabilize. So trends matter, comparing to peers matters. And linking it back to strategy, you mentioned the cash conversion cycle earlier with Walmart. Yeah, that cycle, the time between paying your suppliers and getting paid by your customers is a key operational lever. And shortening it is powerful. Hugely powerful. When Apple really focused on streamlining its supply chain and inventory management back in the early 2010s, they managed to significantly shorten that cycle. What did that achieve? It freed up billions in cash that would otherwise be tied up in working capital. That's cash they could use for R&D, acquisitions, buybacks, whatever. Mm -hmm. A massive strategic advantage gained through operational efficiency. Okay, this brings us to some, let's say, insider knowledge. After digging into all this, which ratios do pros find are maybe the most overrated okay. or misunderstood by the average person? Hmm. Overrated? I'd probably nominate the price-to-earnings P.E. ratio. Really? But it's quoted everywhere, the headline metric. It is, and that's the problem. It's too simple, too easily distorted. Accounting adjustments, one-off gains or losses, even just normal business cycles can swing the, year, uh, the earnings around wildly. Making the P.E. look artificially cheap or expensive. Exactly. It gives you a very broad strokes picture, maybe, but very little deep analytical insight on its own, often more noise than signal. Okay, P.E. is overrated. What about most misleading? You flagged ROE earlier. Yeah, it has to be return on equity, ROE. When you look at it in isolation, we keep saying it, but it's crucial. High ROE can just mean high debt. It can be manufactured. So how do you get past that surface number? How do you see the real source of the return? That's where the DuPont framework comes in. It's essential. Okay, DuPont framework. Sounds technical, but break it down for us. Why is it so important? It's important because it dissects ROE. It breaks it down into its core components, usually three. Profit margin how much profit per dollar of sales, asset turnover, how efficiently assets generate sales, and the equity multiplier, which is basically leverage. So it forces you to see why ROE is what it is. Precisely. Is the high ROE coming from great operations, high margins, efficient mm -hmm. asset use? Or is it just financial engineering jacking up the leverage component? DuPont separates the signal from the noise. It tells you the quality of the return, not just the quantity. That's incredibly useful. Which brings us, I think, to the final really important question for you listening. How do you take all these numbers, all these ratios, and actually connect them back to the business strategy you hear management talking about? That connection is everything. You have to analyze ratios across um, three dimensions, really. Okay, what are they? First, across time. <laughs> are the numbers getting better or worse year after year? What's the trend? Second, across peers. How does the company stack up against its direct competitors? Are they leading, lagging, average? And the third dimension. Third and maybe most critical, across strategy. Do the numbers actually match what the company says it's doing? If management claims they're a premium, high-margin player, but their operating margins are consistently falling or below peers. Then there's a disconnect. 
a red flag. A huge red flag. That misalignment between words and numbers is often where you find the real trouble or the hidden strengths. This has been, well, a really fantastic breakdown. Ratios genuinely turn that raw accounting data into actual financial intelligence, don't they? They really do. We've seen how Apple uses margins to show efficiency, how Boeing's whole structure dictates its asset intensity, how Netflix used leverage for that big strategic pivot. Yeah, and they're all part of that ongoing story, that narrative about the quality of the business, the risks it's taking, and its long-term sustainability. So when you look at any company's financial story, what's the final takeaway, the Enron lesson? I think the ultimate lesson from Enron is a beautiful income statement, fantastic reported revenue. It means absolutely nothing if the cash flow statement and the underlying leverage ratios are telling a much darker story about risk and ultimately a lack of sustainability. You have to look at the whole picture. So what does this all mean? I guess it means that in the right hands, ratios don't just describe what happened yesterday. No, they can actually help predict what might happen tomorrow. They signal stability or instability. Keep digging into the context behind the numbers and always ask. Is this return real? Is it quality? Or is it just fueled by debt? That question gets you to the core of financial intelligence. Thanks for listening to Corporate Finance Explained. If you found this episode valuable, be sure to check out more episodes and explore CFI's highly rated courses at corporatefinanceinstitute.com. Don't forget to subscribe for more deep dives into essential finance topics. See you next time.